we're going to discuss. Today we're going to discuss learning disorders um, and their co coexisting conditions in children. I am Mackenzie Westner, as she mentioned. I'm a behavioral pediatric nurse practitioner, and I practice at the Center for Developing Minds in Los Gatos, California. All right. So just to give you a little bit of, of an outline, um, oops, let's see here, a little bit of an outline um, for the presentation today. We're going to start with um, just an introduction to the concept of learning and behavior. So we'll review um, both of those concepts and we'll get into some general principles um, of learning and then really briefly review the idea of learning and thinking differences in the population. We'll then get into um, what a learning disorder is. So we'll review facts, some terminology, some signs, the identification of a learning disorder or learning disorders the evaluation concept um, and how that works, as well as some resources. We'll talk about developmental delay as well. So we'll review some red flags. We'll talk about the idea of early intervention services or early start. We'll review very briefly um, idea, which is a piece of legislation that's important to cover with this topic. And then we'll get into some coexisting conditions. So we'll review, and this isn't a comprehensive list, but ADHD, communication disorders, motor disorders, mental health disorders, and then I couldn't leave out the memory and processing disorders as well, um, as those certainly impact learning. All right. So introduction to the, the concept of learning. So learning is really in its most basic form, the acquisition of knowledge or skill through experience, through study, um, and also by being taught. So I wanted to include this here because I think it's really important to consider um, that learning is a process and it's a very basic um, concept. And I, I also wanted to emphasize um, the being taught. So it does require instruction. There are many, many factors that influence learning. So keep that in mind as well. Um, we'll get into that as we continue to go along. All right. So I wanted to include the idea of behavior in the presentation as well. Behavior is typically thought of as the way a person acts or conducts themselves, um, especially towards others. And this is in response to a particular situation or a stimulus. So um, I wanted to include my sort of typical definition of behavior, which is any observable action. And I included that here because it's important to consider that stimuli can actually be both internal and external. So if we do have a child who is behaving in a way that is maybe not easy to understand, maybe we think that the environment or the external stimuli are um, suitable and appropriate, um, there could be, and there often are, typically are internal stimuli as well to consider. And um, behaviors can also be very subtle, right? So we have um, really overt behaviors, behaviors that are very, very apparent. Um, as I'm sure all of you have witnessed, and then there are behaviors that are very subtle, right? The, the sort of slight um, adjustment with eye contact or a little um, subtle movement or, or something that can actually um, teach us a little bit more about what's going on for a child. So one in five Americans have learning and thinking differences. And I just wanted to emphasize um, the idea that learning and thinking differences are normal, right? So we all learn and think a little bit differently. Um, and this one in five statistic has to do with Americans who um, have been sort of identified or uh, self-identify as learning and or thinking differently um, than the average person. So there are many patterns um, when it comes to brain strengths or neurodevelopmental strengths, that's a term I'll use um, throughout the presentation to sort of describe the brain and its function, both strengths and difficulties or dysfunctions, right? So there's so many different patterns and they can be quite complex. And as I mentioned, there's a very wide um, variation between 
per, between people, right? Between individuals. And generally speaking, differences do not represent disorder. They do not represent, represent disability or abnormality, right? So if we have the sort of average um, mean, right? The, the, the average sort of way to think or learn um, that's based on statistics. It's sort of um, this range of average. And I'll show you a graph in a moment being a little bit outside of that um, isn't concerning necessarily. And it's also, um, as I mentioned, not considered a disorder or disability. It's when we start thinking about the people that are further um, from the average. So this is a nice visual. You'll notice here um, there's that there's this um, curve towards the middle. We would consider that the average. Um, and as we get further away from the middle, that's when we notice um, more disorder, disability, um, or abnormality. So these are standard deviations. The lower standard deviation, deviation as I mentioned, um, is closer to the average, and then the higher standard deviations are further away. It's kind of nice to keep this in mind if you do ever um, view a psychological assessment or some sort of assessment. These are often used to describe learning, and they should be because they're helpful. Um, so that's something that will hopefully help give you a frame of reference for those things. So uh, thinking or brain functions that impact learning vary quite a bit. Um, this is not an inclusive list. I borrowed this from my practice partner, Damon Korb. He has a nice list here that really describe some of the um, some of the important brain processes that impact learning and, and sort of connects two ideas with each. So when it comes to attention, attention is very connected to self-regulation, right? So um, being able to pay attention and also being able to pay attention to um, like a child's, a child paying attention to their own body and being able to regulate their own attention and, and um, their body. There's also visual spatial skills, which is connected to organization. Um, that's a very visual process, um, visual processing. Memory, so being able to preserve knowledge or preserve um, what's been learned. There's also the idea of receptive language, which means, and we're, we're going to get into all of this later, um, receptive language means the interpretation of language. So being able to receive um, and appropriately interpret or understand language um, that is directed towards a child. And then there's also expressive language. So when a child is able to use what they know and understand about language to express themselves, um, to implement what they've learned. And so, you know, verbalizations, um, that include language that's been taught are considered expressive language. The idea of motor functioning um, is also related to implementation because we're really thinking of motor functioning as movement. And we do learn, I mean, we observe, movement's a very natural process. We also observe um, as we continue to grow, um, there, we sort of observe what is expected with body movements and, and motor, function or motor movements ranges from some of the bigger movements. So we consider, we call those gross motor movements. So that's like the running, jumping, climbing sort of stuff. And then the smaller movements, we often refer to those as fine motor movements. So that's our grasp when we're picking up a pencil um, or a utensil, writing involves fine motor function. So motor functioning is um, a big part of, of behavior and also a big part of learning. The last two concepts on here, um, I included because I think that they're just interesting to consider. The idea of higher order cognition has to do with some of the um, more advanced thinking processes. And these are not things that we expect very young children, certainly not children one to five um, to do. We're not thinking, um, we're not expecting them to practice hindsight or foresight. Although there is, there is a little bit of this that exists throughout the lifespan or we're always working towards this. Um, so when we're thinking about learning from our mistakes, practicing perspective taking hindsight babies do actually do some of this in their own way um, as you know appropriate for their development and so this is a nice idea and then social cognition as well it's a very important idea we live in a society where it's important to get along and to cooperate um, and so the idea of social thinking and perspective taking is also a uh, part of learning or it certainly influences learning All right, so learning and thinking differences. So I'm just going to review a few ideas here. We're going to get into um, coexisting conditions towards the end of the presentation, but learning disorders um, are a 
an example of learning differences that are typically problematic. That's why we call them disorders. There are three main types. Um, there are actually some subtypes within these, although we won't discuss those today. So the idea of having difficulty in reading um, and impairment in reading where it's um, caused problems. So we often call that dyslexia, impairment in writing or dysgraphia, and then impairment in mathematics, um, which we refer to as dyscalculia. Language disorders, so we can have both receptive and expressive language disorders. Attention challenges, um, ADHD. Slow processing speed. Um, this is important because, and I, I specified the slow processing speed because this is actually something that is um, important to consider when we're thinking about learning. Um, we wanna make sure that a child has a chance to process the information that's coming to them. And there are other kinds of processing, um, but slow processing speed is something that is um, really important to consider. There are both motor and or coordination delay and or disorder. So that's something when it comes to movement that can be important and implicated in the learning process. Um, and when we're thinking about school function as well. So wanting to make sure that students are able to um, move in a way that's going to supplement or um, support their learning. Sensory processing challenges. So another form of processing that has to do with um, stimuli and, and the way that stimuli is processed by the brain and the nervous system. And that can have a really big impact on school function and learning. Then there's the idea of social skills and social skill challenges, which can really interfere with learning um, rather significantly when, when students, even if they're able to learn the academic part of a school, there's a lot in school that um, may not be as explicitly taught, but a lot of school is really teaching children how to um, socialize appropriately and continue to um, make progress with social skills. Kenzie, can I uh, add, And then executive uh, function challenges. And I didn't spend too much time reviewing this in the presentation today, but the executive functions are sort of connected to that last slide with some of the higher order thinking functions, um, planning, organization, uh, perspective taking, hindsight, foresight, all of those things are really important. And they certainly have a significant impact on learning. And we'll um, have a chance to look at a video hopefully today that reviews um, organizational challenges from a, a rather young child's perspective. Early elementary Mackenzie, school. Mackenzie, can I ask a quick question since you're Absolutely. looking at sensory processing challenge? I've had a couple questions here oh, um, yeah. about uh, behavior with the internal stimuli. Uh, I would think that maybe that might dovetail into sensory processing challenges. I mean, can, Absolutely. can you address about internal stimuli for behavior? Absolutely, that's a great question. So internal stimuli, I think that sensory processing challenge is a, is a great example with that because, and it's actually, it actually demonstrates both concepts that the external stimuli um, are going to influence a wide range of internal stimuli. So when you have, let's say you have a child who um, is sitting in their chair and there's a breeze coming through the window and maybe there's a peer in the corner who's getting a Kleenex to blow their nose. So that child may be able to process all of those things um, sort of in the backdrop where they're not even aware that they're happening. They're not disturbing. Um, they maybe don't really notice their chair too much, just enough uh, to be sitting comfortably. And then there are, there are other children who may be uh, really distracted by that sensation of the wind. Um, maybe their teacher uh, touches their arm and that's uh, really distracting. Um, that chair could be really uncomfortable, right? They may need um, more stimulation. Um, they may need something on their lap to feel comfortable. So th those are just some basic examples of sensory processing challenges. But I think the sensory processing component is a perfect example of that stimuli idea, although there are other stimuli as well. So for instance, um, when you have a student who is, or a child who is, um, uh, we can think of like, Im like impulsivity, right? So they, they may have a lot of stimuli internally to do certain things that we may not um, expect them or want them to do. So that would be some of the internal. And then also just sort of thinking about mood and, and stress and anxiety. Those, um, those are certainly influenced by our, env our environment, but they are also very internal and we can sort of consider them to be stimuli. Great, thanks a lot. Any other questions that come to mind so far? No.
Okay. No one else has, has posted one. So um, thanks for answering those. Absolutely. You bet. All right. So getting right into the idea of a learning disorder or learning disorders, and we may refer to these, I often refer to these as LD um, throughout the presentation going forward. So a learning disorder is challenged with reading, writing, and or math that lasts at least six months, even with targeted help. So remember that in order for it to be a disorder, it needs to be something that's been taught. So we wouldn't expect um, a child who we, who's uh, perhaps too young to write to have like a writing disorder if, if they've not had op an opportunity to practice and to be taught how to write. Um, but this is just the definition of a learning disorder. Um, and there are different types, as I mentioned. Another component of a learning disorder, I guess another part of this definition, because there's, uh, there's a few things that go into this. So one is um, academic skills that are substantially below what is expected for a child's age that cause problems in everyday activities um, significantly with school. I mean, that's usually where it, where it um, shows up is with school. Difficulties typically start during the school age period. Um, they may not be recognized until later, although difficulties can really show up much earlier. And we'll get into that um, when we get into developmental delay and that's for our younger children. Um, but when it comes to learning disorders themselves, we may be able to um, screen for learning differences or challenge in the earlier years. But when a child enters elementary school, so kindergartners, first graders, that's when we really start seeing these things. Um, and then for some, they're not recognized until later. There are people who are not diagnosed with learning disorders until they're in college, right? And that's certainly not ideal, um, but it, it does happen sometimes. So it's not always apparent. The other component is just that a learning disorder is not due to another condition that can really impact learning. So vision or hearing problems, um, difficulty speaking or understanding the language. So a language, a language disorder, another neurologic issue um, like pediatric stroke, for instance, um, that would be important to rule out. Not that that's a common thing, but just, just sort of keeping that in mind, there can be other um, things to consider when a student's having a hard time learning. couple of facts about learning disorders. So between five to 15% of people do have a learning disorder. Um, so it's not uncommon. And I, I do think that the range um, is part of that, right? Because we do have people that have mild learning disorders as well as people that have more severe learning disorders. They are considered lifelong, meaning that um, they don't just go away when you know, perhaps you have a couple months of instruction, um, but there are many, many strategies and supports that can help children learn and grow into um, what is expected of them um, as teens and adults, right? So they can certainly be successful with the right support and often are. Um, it's common to struggle in more than one area. So it's not uncommon for students to have a reading and a writing disorder um, simultaneously or, you know, math and reading. Um, of course, all of the learning functions are connected as well. So that's a big part of it. For instance, if you have a, a student with dyslexia and math is, is um, let's say there's a unit in math that focuses on word problems, it would be natural for them to really struggle with that. Um, but they can also have a more organic difficulty with numbers and understanding mathematic function. Learning disorders are not related to intelligence um, outside of that discrepancy model, although I actually I don't think I've reviewed that yet. So we'll we'll talk about this, this idea with a discrepancy model, but they're they are not a learning disorder is not an indication that a student is um, has any sort of um, intelligence issues, right? It's it's actually um, its own thing. There are, um, we won't spend too much time reviewing cause. Um, even if someone were to look into the cause, it's always good to understand what's going on, but it typically, um, you know, going down that path isn't, isn't really fruitful and it really doesn't impact the way that we would support a child. Learning disorders are hereditary though. Um, a student is four to 10 times more likely to have a learning disorder if a parent or sibling does. Um, there are some genes that may play a role. Again, there's, there's not a lot of um, 
there's a lot, not a lot of help that we can get from going down that path, but there are genes that have been identified um, that can play a role. And then brain structure and function is actually unique in, in children with learning disorders. And we can actually see differences on brain imaging in terms of the functions of different parts of the brain. And I think that's nice just to understand because it shows us that we all have um, different brains and they all function a little bit differently and that there are physiologic reasons that a student may learn in a unique way or have a learning disorder. So a few things to consider, suspected learning disorders could also be other things. Um, I just wanted to include this to make sure that we're thinking about uh, learning and learning disorders holistically. So there could be mild intellectual disability and I didn't include it on the coexisting conditions because it's typically something that we want to roll out. So if you have a student who is um, really struggling with learning, it's important to consider um, their sort of intellectual capacity or their intellectual um, functioning. So IQ testing often addresses that. So that's a possibility. It doesn't mean um, that it is um, necessarily like a, a really common thing, but it's just something to consider um, for professionals, especially to consider. Hearing and vision impairment is also incredibly important to consider. We wanna make sure, sure that students aren't struggling because they're having a hard time with hearing. Um, what they're um, learning as well as seeing what they're um, expected to be learning at school. So we wanna make sure that we have really clear information about um, both of those things. And we can often understand that just through typical screenings with like well child care, as well as if, you know, when needed, um, if there is concern, sending children to see a specialist to make sure that they're doing okay um, in those areas. Attentional weaknesses. Um, or ADHD are also a really big part or a really common um, coexisting condition in about 10 to 50% of cases. So there's quite a range. And it's also, um, as you can see, it's, it's also something that is often um, connected and really, um, I guess, implicated in the way a child learns. So super important to address that. Mood and emotional disorders are often um, important to consider as well. So depression and anxiety. They're both things that may be interfering with learning and sort of maybe creating this impression of a learning disorder. And they're also very highly co-occurring, meaning students with learning disorder, disorders um, often experience these symptoms to the point where the symptoms themselves are prob problematic, depression, anxiety. And I think having an unidentified learning disorder, we'll get into this, but that can be um, rather depressing when, when a student isn't performing as expected and not getting the help that they need. And it can also be very anxiety provoking. Um, but if you do have a child who has an anxiety disorder, um, even young children can have anxiety disorders. Um, it's important to consider how that anxiety may be impacting their learning. Because if, if you have, uh, let's, let's say a four-year-old who's um, struggling to learn and that four-year-old's incredibly anxious about interacting uh, perhaps with the person who's providing the instruction, they, they, aren't really, they aren't really able to demonstrate what they're capable of. So it's important to consider that component as well. This is a really important idea. So parent and school expectations that may not line up with a student's abilities and interests. And I, I think it's important to consider because it's really, it's one of those things that, um, you know, students, when we study child development, students are certainly capable of learning and um, there's a range with ability and interest. But when we have a school environment or even a family environment that doesn't really match that student's um, profile, that can actually create quite a bit of difficulty. So for instance, if we have a student who maybe is rather at level or very, very slightly delayed, and perhaps there are parents who have um, expectations that that student be advanced, right? Or be like a year ahead, that does happen. Um, so that's important to consider. And then of course there are kids too who are really just not interested in the academic um, instruction itself. And they may be very, very kinetic um, and creative and um, you know, interested, inquisitive and interested in building things, but maybe not interested as much in like language um, or writing. So that's an important thing to consider also. We wanna make sure that children have the ability to pursue what they're interested in as well as learn um, what, what's important for them to learn um, language and, and math and that kind of stuff is very important science as well. Um, environmental factors are important to consider. So lack of opportunity, certainly when we have children who aren't getting the education or the instruction um, that they deserve, when we have children who aren't able to be at school or just aren't at school um, as much as, as is ideal, um, sometimes teaching, right? Um, I think that there, 
are so many great teachers in this area. And there, there are also times, um, of course, in the United States where some teaching um, may not be a great fit or it may not be, um, I guess, appropriate for the student. So that's important to consider. And then students that maybe don't understand language uh, or the English uh, language or whatever language is expected of them as we would, um, I guess, want them to in order to learn when instruction is delivered in that language. So English as a second language is a common thing to consider because we wanna make sure that students are um, having some opportunity to learn in their primary language if possible, and also getting a little extra support if English is a second language to help them with learning. There are medical causes, as I mentioned, um, always good to consider that kind of stuff. Typically that medical background or often um, it's somewhat clear um, disordered sleep. Um, so just other things to consider. And this is more so for professionals or for pediatric providers. A little bit of terminology here, I wanted to make sure to differentiate. I think terminology can be um, rather confusing at times because there's a lot of, there are a lot of labels um, that we use. There's a lot of jargon that goes along with, um, with child development really, but also um, disorders, uh, diagnoses and school planning as well. So the medical term for learning disorder is specific learning disorder. Um, the educational term under idea, which we'll get into later, is specific learning disability. They really are the, the same thing. They're, we sort of describe them as different because we have two different fields that, um, that work together, but the ideas for both of these are the same and also the, um, they can be used interchangeably. So the language will look a little bit different depending on the context. So I wanted to get into the signs of learning dysfunction or learning, uh, um, having a learning disorder. And we do spend a lot of time going over this. Um, this is a big component of the presentation. And the most important thing to consider with learning dysfunction and disorder is that there, the signs really depend on an individual, right? So signs are going to be different for different children. It really, they really depend on the subject. So they're of course gonna look different for different subjects, for different ages, certainly, as well as context. So we wanna keep all of that in mind. And the range of difficulty um, is mild to severe. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Some of these things as we go along, you'll notice are, um, are not uncommon um, for children who may be struggling just a little bit. And then of course, some of the other signs are um, more prominent or concerning for children who are struggling quite a bit. All right, so the following are signs of having a reading disorder and in a preschooler. So struggling to name familiar objects um, is one possible sign mispronouncing or reversing words. So for instance, I included this um, example of rather than saying teddy bear, saying Betty tear and switching words and sounds like that. Having a hard time learning songs, nursery rhymes, and even when rhyming is involved, which can often be helpful. Some uh, preschoolers struggle in this way. Not being able to sing the alphabet after having been taught and practiced. Um, Having a hard time following stories, um, event descriptions, not in a logical order. And what I mean by that is when we have preschool, uh, preschoolers who can't follow just really basic storylines, and if they are trying to describe an event, um, perhaps a simple event, that it's hard to follow and it's um, then they're not able to put that event into order, a basic order. And then when it comes to following directions in general, this can be a sign of a few different things, but it could be a, design, a sign of a learning dysfunction. So difficulty following directions, um, certainly with multiple steps. So signs of a reading disorder in a little bit older um, profile here with a kindergartner to a second grader. So confusing similar appearing letters is something that we see the examples here, you'll notice B and D are very similar. P and Q are very similar. Um, confusing similar sounding letters as well. So F, V, B, P, D, and T um, have some similar sounds. Some students have difficulty with names of letters and knowing sound letters um, or, or knowing the sounds that letters make. Um, so that's something that can be uh, a, an issue and maybe a sign of a learning disorder 
having trouble separating or combining sounds to form words is another thing. So um, when it comes to learning sounds, that has a, a really, that's a really important part of learning to read. So students who have a hard time with that um, may have a learning disorder. Not being able to remember how words are spelled and not being able to apply basic spelling rules, um, certainly the ones that have been taught would be um, a possible sign. And then struggling to read familiar words. So especially when there are pictures, for instance, if you have a child who's um, perhaps going through a book where there are pictures and they're still struggling to read um, those words, for instance, they may say when they're reading, there may be the word house um, that's on the page. Um, and they say home when they see the picture. So it shows that they're able to identify the picture and um, they know the meaning, but the reading itself isn't happening. Any questions with any of this so far? Yes, I have one question here. How many preschool age children are diagnosed with reading disorder? What was that? How many preschool aged children are diagnosed, are diagnosed with reading disorder? I guess dyslexia. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I don't actually have a statistic on that, but when, pre when we're thinking about the age ranges, it's less common for preschoolers to be diagnosed than it is for students um, you know, older than them. So like the kindergartner to second grade range is more likely to be diagnosed um, and there are some preschoolers who are diagnosed, but it would also require, um, for instance, targeted intervention, right? So that would that would need to include, like for instance, a, a preschooler in order for a preschooler to be diagnosed, that would need to include um, identifying that there's an issue, giving some, some support to that student, some targeted um, support, and also having an assessment. But there are preschoolers who are um, diagnosed. I see another, I'm sorry, I see another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says, uh, many times the school refuse to offer support when there is an emotional and mental disability, unless there is a loss of education. Loss meaning there is a big impact on their academics. If a student can sit through class and not give problems, many times they are not considered for support. How can educator, educators or parents advocate for support? How do we justify students needing help mm. uh, or explaining that emotional disability is a disability based on the examples you gave? Thank you. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. And fortunately, we are gonna get into that um, a little bit down the road here. And I think one thing I will say now though, I think that for certainly advocating for your child. So um, I think parents, do have a really important perspective, of course, because um, you see your child and, and you have um, some extra insight into what's going on internally often. Um, and then also having some support, right? So having a good relationship with the educators and the school, communicating with them um, rather often. And then also if, if you do need some extra support with that, because it can be really challenging and I'll give you guys some guidance with that. Um, but having someone else like a helper, whether that's um, perhaps a um, like a healthcare provider, a pediatrician, um, like a nurse or a social worker, someone who, um, who can help with that. Yeah, help, help you guys describe um, what's needed and how it impacts the child's learning. But we'll review a few things, uh, really specific things that you can do to communicate with the school. Yeah, good question. I have a couple more here now. <laughs> They're sure. popping up. Um, when reading, if a child skips words in a sentence, is that a sign of learning disability? That is a great question. I'm glad you asked it because um, it's possible, right? So when, when words are skipped, it's possible that the student is maybe choosing the words that they do know and skipping over the words that they don't know. Um, there's often, I mean, it's possible, but there are often students who skip words for other reasons as well. So there are often students, like we'll talk about ADHD, but students with ADHD commonly rush um, and so it could be related to that. There's also some visual processing stuff and tracking that can go into that as well. So we wanna make sure that we're thinking about all of that, all of that stuff um, in conjunction with considering um, their reading function. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Um, I, I, <laughs> we're gonna have, all of a sudden, all of a sudden people are asking questions here. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll address this later. How do we get children evaluated? 
Oh, absolutely. Excellent question. I, I do include that, um, or I do review that in a little bit here. So we'll go into that. I'm glad that you asked. Okay, great. Important. And then, um, oh boy, here we go. Um, one more is replacing words like to or from with other, hmm, is replacing the words like to or from with other like, oh, I don't quite understand. Um, the question here is replacing the words like to or from with others like for etc an ld oh i see. i'm not yeah, sure what that question is i hope you know <laughs> well i think you you may be referring to one of the first things here i'm um, skipping skipping words well skipping small words um is the example here on the list but but replacing words as well is something that um it could potentially it's it's a possible sign, but I would say not in isolation. So if that's the only thing um, we want to make sure that when it when there's a sign, there could be like one sign. Um, but if there are a couple of these, I would say it's it's more um, telling so that so replacing words with other words that don't make sense. Um, it's possible it's possibly a sign, but it could also be um, some disorganization right some recall. Um, maybe a student's th maybe thinking through it too fast i um, mean it also depends on their age um okay great okay one last one and then we'll let mckenzie um continue the question is how can a parent know if the signs of reading disorders are actually reading disorders are due to their age for example a six-year-old who does great with a spelling test but will occasionally mix up the d and b writing them and sounding them out Mm. And and the first part of the question was how can you tell if it's a learning disorder or due to their age or due to their age, yeah. For so that's for a six year old. That's actually um, I think that's an important question because it is important to consider what we would expect for different ages. So when we have kiddos, I think you said six years old, um, a kiddo that age, there is a range in terms of learning different these things and. Um, for a six-year-old, if it's happening occasionally and maybe only in one context but not another, I would say that it's important to monitor it and make sure that that student's um, getting the help that they need and, and perhaps um, some support and some instruction for fine-tuning that. But it could be that um, you know they are still getting the hang of it and um, it may be, be something that they just need to overcome. It could also be, you know, if there are other things that are happening, um, just good to monitor. I think at that phase, I would probably just monitor it and see if there's anything else that comes up. But it can be hard to know. And, that, and that's, of course, why we do consider evaluations when we have more significant concerns, when both teachers and parents are concerned and thinking that learning is a, is a pretty significant issue. That's a reason to evaluate. Yeah. Okay, great. That's it. Thanks for answering those. Yeah, Mackenzie. absolutely. Absolutely. So some other signs of reading um, disorders in third to fifth graders. And of course, these are, um, these are just these ranges are, it's hard to, you know, this could be like a second grader, or sixth grader too, but we're thinking about um, with this range, students who are skipping small words such as to, for, or of when reading, um, having a hard time sounding out new words, so just having a hard time with reading in general, reversing letters, um, not being able to quickly recognize words that are typically very easy to recognize. We call those sight words. Um, so the, it, and and are all words that should be recognized um, pretty automatically. Um, they're used really, really frequently. So we consider those sight words and there are others um, as well. Having poor inconsistent spelling, um, avoiding reading is a huge one. Um, or being upset when asked to read specifically. So that's actually, to me, I think that's a really important um, behavior to consider, like wanting to really, it's really important to understand why a child is doing that. It could be um, that they, I mean, it could be in the context of ADHD that they are um, wanting, not wanting to sit and having a hard time paying attention. It could be that they're not a big fan of reading, but I, this is a, a pretty big sign of um, having some reading difficulty. The following are some signs of having a writing disorder, dysgraphia. So often students who do really struggle with writing have an easier time expressing their thoughts verbally than they do putting them on paper. So this is a student who perhaps is talking to mom um, at the kitchen counter, it's time to do some, some writing work for school, and they tell their mom, 
um, all these cool ideas, right? So they have these ideas that are flowing and, and they're doing some good thinking about this assignment and they express their ideas verbally. And then mom says, okay, you write that down. And then the student doesn't know where to start or really can't write them down um, and needs a lot of support with the actual writing process. And of course, writing is a, is a process. And so when we have young, younger students who are just learning to write, it's different. But when we have students who um, you know, have been practicing writing for quite a while, um, that would be a sign that there is um, some more organic difficulty with writing or some um, continued difficulty with writing. That may be a sign of a disorder. Um, also just having writing that includes many grammar mistakes or missed words. Of course, that's a part of uh, the process of learning to write is, is learning grammar um, and that sort of thing and misspelling words here and there. But we wanna make sure that students, um, as they continue to make progress with their writing, that they are making progress with grammar um, and spelling and that sort of, sort of thing. So for kindergartners to second graders, um, those, those signs um, on that last slide were just sort of general, general signs. But for this age range, we often see children um, have a hard time with labeling pictures, even if they're like a, are a few, well, having a few words and, and a picture on a page. So typically for kinder to first grade, um, having a hard time labeling those pictures with a few words in writing. Um, even if there is maybe like an example written down or a couple starting words written down. Um, having sentences that are hard or, or viewing sentences that are hard to make sense of. So when you have a student in this range who's maybe written a few sentences, having a teacher or parent who's trying to make sense of what was written and, and that can be um, very challenging often for students with, with writing disorders. Children may get confused about differences um, between types of writing. Again, this this is something I would actually probably think of this as a little bit more for older students, but it could be even for um, like a second grader, for instance, having a hard time understanding the difference between like fiction, um, like a, a fun sort of fantasy make-believe story um, when taught what that means, and then maybe like a more informative um, story when they're writing that, uh, when they're asked to write like a make-believe story, a fun story that they invent versus um, a story about their own life and having a hard time understanding those things. And then just having difficulty writing one to two paragraphs about a really sort of basic personal experience or story. Um, that's something that we typically expect this age range um, to be able to do. And we'll watch this video later. This is a nice description from the perspective of a, a young student. So in the third to fifth grade range, we're, we're thinking of students who are, who are demonstrating more simplistic writing as compared to peers, as students who may be demonstrating some signs of having a writing disorder. Um, when, when we're comparing, like for instance, often at this range, there are a variety of sentences that are used to express ideas. Um, and there's a lot of flow that can happen with writing. And so when we have a student who isn't doing that, that's another um, reason to consider what's going on. Part of the writing process is drafting and planning. Um, so when we have students who are maybe doing drafts without any planning, um, they're not really revising their writing, um, even when they're instructed to do so or there are exercises um, that are guiding them to do so. Students who have trouble with organizing um, their writing and, and, um, and with content for different kinds of writing, so narratives and opinions and that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll have another video that goes into a student's perspective um, later on. So here are some signs of having a math disorder. Um, and this is in the preschool range. So preschoolers who are have, having trouble counting and skipping over numbers may, may struggle um, with math. Children who don't seem to understand the meaning of counting Certainly, so when you ask a young child for, or a preschooler for five blocks and that child just hands you a group of blocks, um, they may not really understand the concept of counting. Students have a hard time recognizing patterns. So for instance, if we have a student who is um, looking at a visual pattern, um, perhaps with objects and they're being instructed on the idea of uh, the smallest objects ranging to the largest object or shortest to tallest and, and students who have a hard time understanding that may have a difficulty um, with numbers and with math. Um, not having a good understanding of number symbols. So um, 
for instance, the number seven um, and connecting that to the word seven um, and not being able to connect a number to a visual or like an object. So knowing that um, the number three applies to three things, right? Like three apples or three um, porcupines, whatever it is, just making sure that a student um, isn't struggling with that because they're really struggling to understand the concept of numbers. Other signs for school-age children. So having uh, students who have trouble learning and recalling basic math facts, um, for instance, two plus four equals six is something that we would expect a school-age child to know um, right off the bat to have um, a really like sort of quick understanding or um, and recall with those basic math facts. When students in this age range are still using their fingers to count instead of using more advanced strategies like mental math, um, having difficulty identifying math signs like plus and minus and using them in the right way. Um, math phrases like greater than and less than are important to consider at this age too. Um, and then not understanding place value and putting numbers in the wrong column when it comes to um, doing that written math. And this, that's an important skill at this, at this age. So just a quick um, reminder that these skills do need to be taught, right? So we're not expecting students who haven't had instruction, for instance, um, to be good at these things. And signs of learning disorders are only signs when students struggle despite instruction. So for instance, let's say there's um, something that, you know, sometimes parents are concerned about certain things and then we find that um, that unit was maybe moved or perhaps um, the teacher hasn't instructed on that specific aspect yet. Um, so we wanna make sure that students are getting, getting instruction. All right, so we're gonna get into evaluations here. Um, any questions before I get started on this section? I, I don't have anything in the Q and A. Brenda, do you have anything? So it's important, so of course, and, and to speak, um, to answer someone's question, to speak to the idea of like, um, the evaluation topic and, and how do we really identify learning disorders and know whether or not it's just sort of um, the student's age because they're, they're still learning it or it, there's actually a learning disorder or learning um, dysfunction. It is important to consider the idea of evaluating a student. So, the, so really the answer to like, how do we know if, if a student has a learning disorder? The only way to know for sure is to have an evaluation. So we're not expecting teachers or parents to identify learning disorders. Although teachers and parents sometimes do have some pretty um, really helpful suspicion, right? Some pretty good information that's um, that can really influence the, um, the process of evaluating. But the, the way to know whether or not a learning disorder is happening is, is for a formal evaluation. And that can happen through the school, um, the public school system or privately. And the assessments are typically conducted by educational psychologists or other kinds of psychologists, although it does depend on the specifics of the learning concern. So for instance, if you have a student who may have a language or speech problem, um, there could be other medical issues. So it's, it's typically um, a psychology sort of evaluation, but other professionals may contribute to the assessments as well. And the value, evaluations are typically not like a, a quick process. They're often split between a few days. There's um, a lot of testing that can go into those. And then they do also include conversation with a child um, and that child's parents and often the teachers. Um, and there are many exercises and activities um, that the psychologist will want or the professional will want to use for that assessment. But the, taking the history on the concerns will, will certainly um, be a part of the evaluation. So the idea of evaluating is important because we wanna make sure that students are getting the support that they need to succeed. So that's really um, the end goal with an evaluation. And until a student has a diagnosis or identification of a learning disorder or learning disability, we really aren't able to provide them with the support they need, certainly in the public school system, but really even in the private system as well, unless they're going to a school that is um, specialized and, and known to provide accommodations or specialized um, learning instruction, we, we want to make sure that we have a really good understanding of what's going on. So evaluation is really important. So here's how to request an evaluation. 
So the first step is to ask your child's teacher or principal where to send a request to. And if they don't know or you're not able to get in touch with them, you can also just contact the school, the public school district's um, main office, and they should be able to help you. So when we're requesting evaluation, we're having parents um, write formal letters. So you could write a formal letter after maybe um, discussing the concerns with the teacher or um, the principal or the pediatrician, but if you're really concerned and you're able to describe that in a letter, you can just go ahead and write a letter. Um, and we do want to make sure that you put your, your concerns into writing when you're requesting evaluation because um, that's the sort of ticket to get the process started. So the school does need to respond within a specific time frame when a letter is delivered. So make sure to be really specific about the reason for your request. So you can say, um, I, it's totally fine to say, I think my student might have a learning disorder um, and here are some, some reasons why. You don't have to include reasons. Um, you can also use a diagnosis, whether or not it's formal, like whether or not there is a formal diagnosis that perhaps you've learned through um, a private assessment or if it's just a strong suspicion. It's, it's totally fine to say, I think that my student has a specified learning disorder or um, dyslexia. It's, it's fine to say that. Um, and then also, I think it's helpful to um, just to state that you're giving consent for an evaluation because that is something that's needed um, for it to get going. And so if you put that in writing from the get go, it can be helpful um, for the school to have that because they'll be able you'll have to sign for that. And there's also a consent form, but you'll be able to um, get moving with that. I would recommend ensuring that the note or the letter is delivered by hand delivering it if you do type it out and print it or, or um, write it on a piece of paper. And then when if you were to hand deliver um, with that person, whoever receives the letter, ask for like a date stamp and an initial um, and a copy for your records to show that it was delivered. You can also do certified mail or email. Um, email can show um, like delivery. Um, so those are all options and living in the sort of electronic world that we're living in, email is not uncommon for these letters and that's okay to do. And then if you don't get a response in a week, make sure to follow up. It's something that um, for, it's not uncommon for schools to take a little longer. Um, sometimes it's just related to, you know, other evaluations that they may have in the queue. Um, you know, wanting to make sure also like that um, you, you got to the right person that, you know, there may be a conversation to be had, but just follow up if you don't get a response in a week. Um, and if you have a phone conversation too, if you happen to call um, perhaps like the district or anyone um, that's helped you, make sure to send a follow-up email that outlines the conversations that you had. Because sometimes what happens is parents are having, having and sometimes really good verbal conversations with educators. And then when it comes to the formal process, if those conversations aren't in writing, um, they don't always translate really directly to the sort of evaluation that we're, um, we're often pushing for or advocating for. Any questions on that? Um, I have a one question um, said, um, can we say my child has a possible ADHD, uh, my, my child has possible ADHD and we want to evaluate the possibilities of learning disorders that may be comorbid with the condition. Is that something Absolutely. they can ask for? Absolutely. Yep. You can put really any concern that you have in the letter, but that if I was reading, and of course I'm, I'm not in the school district reading these letters, but if I was, I would, I would say that that would be, that'd be a good letter. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And you can provide some, you know, a little bit more background on um, if there perhaps is like a medical diagnosis, like a tick disorder or an anxiety disorder or something, um, because it can all sort of influence learning, but ADHD would be um, important to include in there. Absolutely. Especially if there's a combination or potential combination of the two. Yeah. And, and some of these, for some of your students, um, there may already be like a, maybe a, a service plan set up or a 504 plan set up maybe for ADHD. And sometimes there are students who have been identified to have like diagnosed with ADHD, um, but not identified as a student with a learning disorder. And so we wanna make sure that we're advocating um, for those students and not assuming that because they've been assessed before that they don't have a learning disorder if there's good reason to suspect that they may. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, is it back, backtracking a little bit here? Um, the question is, could you please let us know what strategies can help if the child has difficulty with comprehension and math? Oh, that's a good question. 
I will see, I don't, um, I'm trying to think of, so we can talk, why don't we say that for the end for the Q and A? Cause we can certainly talk about that. And um, I can actually give you, I can pull up some of the strategies that I share. It might take me a moment, but um, we can talk about that towards the end. Absolutely. Um, I just want to uh, add uh, for participants here, we have a wonderful education department that addresses evaluations, IEPs, um, the evaluation process, section 504. Go to our website and click under education and there is even templates that people can use for this, this evaluation request. So please feel free to explore our website uh, under the education section and you'll get lots of resources there. So this is a review of the evaluation process for an individualized education plan. And I didn't really include a breakdown between different kinds of education plans, but when we're thinking about learning disorders, what, what goes along with a learning disorder is an individualized education plan or an IEP. Um, so that process evaluating for that would include referral right, for a special education evaluation. So that's that letter. Um, sometimes we can have supporting letters. I've written a number of supporting letters to schools to sort of help advocate for students. Um, so some for, sort of referral, um, typically self-referral for special education evaluation, parents do need to consent. There should be an assessment plan that's created, meaning the school should outline um, what the plan is to evaluate that student. And then of course the evaluation or the assessment is then conducted. Um, and then there's an IEP meeting. So the evaluation needs to be reviewed. And then the discussion at this meeting will be whether or not a student is deemed eligible. Um, it's called eligibility determination. And that is actually based on whether the student has one or more of the 13 disabilities listed in the, in the IDEA Act. So I'll, I'll actually go into that um, a little bit later, but that's going to be a really big part of, of the evaluation process because, because there's a list. The IEP is then created, assuming that they are eligible, um, and the IEP is reviewed annually. So infants and toddlers can also be assessed, um, and it's in fact very important that they are when there are concerns. So even very young children, so newborns uh, to three-year-olds can be assessed and should be assessed when there are reasons to do so. And this occurs through early intervention services. Um, which are supports that can help babies and toddlers with developmental delays. So developmental delay is when a child's development is slowed and, and in some contexts it may um, seem to halt or stop. Um, there are times when it seems to reverse or perhaps does in fact stop or reverse, but we're thinking of developmental delay as some sort of slowing down um, with child development. So specialists have identified typical ranges within which infants, toddlers, and children master certain tasks. And so there are four, uh, and these are interrelated categories when it comes to child development. And, and these are just, um, there are other categories as well, but these are just like the major ones um, that we consider. So motor skills, cognitive skills, so cognition, which is like thinking and learning, um, social skills and emotional skills. And keep in mind that um, when we have, sort of going back to that standard deviation thing, when we have a young child who's maybe a little bit slower with some of these things, that's okay. And they may be quicker in other areas. Um, and that's still considered normal, right? Because we have this sort of like middle 50% um, um, standard deviation or like this zero standard deviation average, right? So like, we just have this idea of like the norm and then we have um, anywhere outside of that along that, that curve. And so just consider, consider that when considering a student's um, development and progress or a young child's development or progress. Um, it's okay if, if the child's a little bit slow in some of these areas. Um, when a child is developing much more slowly than typical or is rather consistently slow in one or more area, um, certainly if they seem to stop developing in one or more area altogether, that could be um, a, a sign of a developmental delay. And certainly when there is, um, you know, a halt or sort of backwards motion, that's, um, that would warrant a, a quick call to the pediatrician um, to make sure that we're, that we're being um, proactive with understanding that. Um, also keep in mind that children are naturally motivated to learn about the world and to develop. So when we're thinking about child development, we're thinking about, uh, you know, if, if children are continuing to grow and develop um, in these areas, 
and and maybe they have a period where um, they're not not growing or seeming to develop as much. And then perhaps they have a period where they're seeming like um, they're making really you know incredible strides. That's all part of the natural process. Um, but children should be motivated and interested um, in learning in general. So keep that in mind too, because when we do have a young child who um, doesn't seem very interested in their world or very motivated uh, to learn. Um, it could be, you know, another issue. It could be like a, another sort of behavioral concern. So that's important to consider. So here are some sort of general red flags when it comes to child development. So at one year, if a child's not imitating sounds, not standing to pull themselves up, um, like on an edge or like withholding onto something, not indicating what they want by pointing or, or gesturing and saying, look, um, those are red flags. So those are, those are things that we would expect a one-year-old to do. Um, at 18 months old, a child who's not feeding themselves with a utensil, um, not squatting on their own, like spontaneously and not engaging in sort of functional play, like using objects for their intended purpose, um, whether that's like a, a toy, um, like a toy, uh, let's see here, car and, and rolling it along and that kind of stuff or toy airplane, for instance, um, those are reasons to, um, to consider whether or not they may have a developmental delay. They, they typically with, with those sort of, um, uh, milestone milestones, if they're not meeting them, that typically means that there is an issue at two years old. If a child's not walking up the stairs or not using two word phrases, um, that's a reason to get in right away. A three-year-old who's not aware of their environment is not riding a tricycle, um, having been given the opportunity to do so. I sometimes get um, families who will say, oh, no, they, no, my kid cannot ride a trike. And then I ask, um, you know, if they've had access to one and the answer is no. So just making sure that it's provided, not imitating, um, you know, others, that would be another concern. Um, Three-year-olds do a lot of imitation. At four years, if you have a child who's not listening to a story, um, not speaking in sentences, um, if they're banging their head or rocking, if they're not um, toilet trained, although um, sometimes just that in and of itself, uh, that could be a genetic thing and um, that's sort of its own category, but that's, that's one thing to consider. And then not drawing, being able to draw a basic sort of human um, stick figure or some sort of human figure. Um, at five years, magical thinking, still like if magical thinking is still dominant, um, that might be a concern too. Like if you have a child who doesn't seem to be very, very in touch with reality and a five-year-old with no impulse control. So that, that's the kiddo, like with the no impulse control, that's the kiddo who may be um, kind of darting across the street when they see something on the other side of the road. Um, of course, there are safety issues with that or a child who's um, grabbing things um, off the shelves at the grocery store to the point of like, um, you know, not being able to go to the grocery store sort of thing. Um, so just a lot that goes along with that. Any questions at this point? Um, I think I'm going to hold this one question till afterwards, but maybe this would be a good time to take a, a 10 minute break here. It's 1106. Sure. So Absolutely. is this a good time for your slides, McKenna, or not? Yep. Okay. All right. Let's take a 10 minute break here and we'll meet back at 1116. And please come back because we're going to see some of those wonderful videos that Mackenzie has and, um, and uh, also maybe a written exercise or two when we have the time. So see you back in a few minutes. Yes, there's. Oh, just want to let you know that Mackenzie is going to be covering some early start um, uh, slides here, but actually, next November 10th, and you'll be receiving a mailer about flyer about this in a couple of days. There's going to be one specifically on infant child development, red flags, and how early start can help on November 10th. So um, if um, you need more information about that, we would love to have you attend next month. So whenever Mackenzie's ready, then we can resume. Thanks. Great. All right. All right, so jumping back in here to the idea of early intervention um, or early start in California. And 
A quick review of what that is. So this is a service that helps young children um, from birth to three with developmental delays, and it helps these kiddos work towards meeting their developmental milestones. The idea here is to give them the support that they need to meet those milestones and to catch up. Um, it's sort of like special ed, but for the youngest segment of our population, and it really does vary state to state. Um, the services do depend on the child and, and what their struggles are. Um, so an evaluation is needed. This is this is a specific kind of, a, of evaluation that is conducted through the Early Start System or EIS. Um, and for children who qualify, there is something that's called an Individualized Family Service Plan or IFSP that's created. And that would define the specific goals and the types of services that would be needed for that child and for that family. Um, so Early Start focuses on the following areas, um, the physical skills, um, whether gross or fine motor, walking, drawing, building, crawling, um, the cognitive skills. So that's when that thinking and learning function comes in. And certainly problem solving is a huge part of that. Um, communication skills. So um, using language, talking, listening, understanding others, um, self-help or also called adaptive skills. So eating and dressing, the sort of activities of daily living that we want our children to be able to practice um, and to learn. And then social and emotional growth. So that has to do with um, interactions, play, certainly at this age, um, it's all about play and just um, that playful interaction with others. So I did include um, the website here for the California Department of Developmental Services, the early start page in case it's helpful. Um, like I said, the qualification varies from state to state, but generally speaking, the following is what would qualify a young child for early start. So this is a child with um, a developmental delay, a child with a specific health condition that would likely lead to a delay. So that could be hearing loss, um, certain genetic syndromes, birth defects, and then there are many other things as well. Um, how to prep, I won't go into this too much since you guys will have a, a presentation or there'll be opportunity for a presentation on this soon, but um, make sure to make a list of concerns and questions before you have an early start um, assessment so you can look up typical milestones if you'd like. Um, if if that doesn't sound too daunting, you can kind of look them up and consider those. Um, I wouldn't Sometimes parents, um, that can be a stressful process, right? Because again, there's, there's a range with development, but if you would like to look those up, that could be helpful. Um, make sure to talk to your healthcare provider, your primary care pediatric provider, the, the person who is doing those checkups um, for your young child and then contact um, the actual center. Um, the evaluation includes the evaluator, the childhood early childhood specialist looking at the baby or the toddler skill set, and then having conversation with um, that those parents about their concerns. And so the family part of that um, IFSP outlines what families need to do in order to help their, their kiddos. So that's a big and really important part of part of it. And families also need to give consent before that plan goes into action. There are many services that can be included in these plans: um, speech and language therapy physical therapy or OT, um, occupational therapy, um, often referred to as OT, psychological support services, um, which can be very import important. There's also medical nursing and nutrition services. So keep in mind that this, um, when we're thinking of early start, we're thinking of overall development and, and certainly the medical or physical component um, could be included. Whereas later on, once the child turns three, it sort of transfers to just the education. Um, hearing or vision care, home visits, uh, social work services, and then transportation when needed. So there's quite a bit that Early Start can do for families and for kids. Here's some contact info in case it's helpful. Um, you guys will have access to this after the presentation. And I did really briefly want to touch on this um, piece of legislation, and you may or may not be familiar with this, but this act is called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And I wanted to communicate that when it comes to payment for this evaluation process, when it's through early start or through the school district, um, IDEA covers that, right? So IDEA covers the cost of early intervention, early start, um, covers you know individualized family service plans, and that support, and it also covers the public school district's education plans and that evaluation process, whether it's a 504 plan or an IEP. Um, and there's also, you know, the act really outlines um, 
the law, which is that children do have a right to this, that um, it's part of our government, that it's something that children um, with the public school system do have a right to have the support that they need to have an appropriate education. So that's really important to, um, to note also. And I think part of the process of making sure that students are getting that involves making sure that you do have a good support team and you do understand um, what, what sort of educational rights exist. So there are 13 disabilities that are listed under IDEA and, and these are going to determine whether or not a student is eligible for an IEP. Um, there's quite a bit here. So like emotional disturbance, for instance, someone had asked about, I can't remember if someone asked or if it was one of the written questions, but someone had, I think someone had asked about the emotional behavioral component. So this is something that, um, it, it can take a lot of communication because it's not always clear to educators and this, you know, as many of you may know, um, I know that there was a comment or um, some conversation in the chat that included, um, I believe some frustration, which makes sense because this is not, this is not always a very, you know, really easy, simple process. And um, it does require quite a bit of communication and advocacy. Um, and that's, that's where I come in. That's where um, Parents Helping Parents comes in. So making sure that we're helping families navigate all of this. Um, but emotional disturbance is something that would qualify someone for an IEP. And we just have to um, sort of help educators understand what's going on emotionally, because um, there, there are certain um, circumstances or I guess qualifiers for that. Um, physical disabilities, um, multiple disabilities, um, certainly if there's like an intellectual disability, um, other health impairments, so ADHD, Tourette syndrome, epilepsy. So this is important to note too, because ADHD is often, when there is ADHD, it's often, uh, um, it often goes into the 504 plan accommodation. And that is sort of used when we think that we can accommodate, make some accommodations for that, that student with ADHD to be successful. But ADHD can really interfere um, with learning. And when it does, we, we wanna make sure that we are able to intervene, which is where an IEP comes in. Um, so it's important, the advocacy and, um, and communication is important with that as well. Um, learning disabilities um, are in here. Speech and language impairment is in here, traumatic brain injury and then visual impairment. Um, so that's an important list. So here's some resources, um, learning disorder resources. Um, you guys will have access to those. Getting into coexisting conditions here and then, and then we'll um, sort of move along and, and hopefully get into some of the videos and um, the exercise, but certainly the Q&A. So coexisting conditions, this, is, this list here um, includes important ones that I wanted to discuss today. There are others. Um, ADHD is a huge one. Um, communication disorders, that one's big as well. Um, motor disorders, mental health disorders, memory processing disorders. Um, so ADHD is described as a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity and impulsivity that has been around for, it's not, you know, people, children can go through phases of this kind of stuff for other reasons, but this is something that has been a pattern that's been around for at least six months. Um, and, and also out of sort of what's expected for, for that child's age or development. So when students are standing out from their peers related to these symptoms, um, when these symptoms interfere with important things, um, like what's expected for a student. So self-esteem, their learning, um, just their overall school function, their social life, for example, ADHD in order to be considered ADHD also needs to show up in at least two settings. Um, so school and home and before the age of 12. Um, that's not a quick note on that is that that's not always the case in practice, similar to how sometimes learning disorders aren't diagnosed until later. Although, you know, it's often like a retrospective conversation where we're looking back on a, on a person's childhood or learning and, and realizing, wow, you, you've had a learning disorder all this time, somewhere with ADHD. So the idea is that the symptoms showed up, um, were present when a student was younger than 12, but they may not be identified um, before a student turns 12. And that they're not a result of avoidance, anxiety, 
lack of understanding or learning, um, you know, a learning dysfunction, though they often co-occur with those things, right? So there's quite a bit of anxiety avoidance, um, learning dysfunction that, that happens in conjunction with ADHD. So here are some general signs um, that your school-age child may have ADHD, struggling to pay attention um, to things that your child is not interested in. I make that indication because it's, I think it's a common misunderstanding that um, most of, I'll say most of the assessments that I do for ADHD, um, I'm told that this, the child can pay great attention to their interests. Um, that tends to be the case with people is that when we're super into something, it's not always the case. Um, there are students who have a hard time sustaining focus to anything, but it's actually rather common. Um, so we're thinking about struggling to pay attention to things that are maybe not uh, super fun for this kiddo, not seeming to remember information that was recently delivered, um, or perhaps info that you would expect your child to remember, like a routine, um, perhaps upon arriving home from school or, um, or you know, an evening routine. Um, missing details, whether information is delivered, uh, delivered verbally, for instance, or um, written information, so on schoolwork, in conversation. A student who has a, a hard time following instructions um, and finishing things, and that can actually be either at school or either at school or at home. So it could be um, having a hard time following instructions in the classroom as well as at home. It's often related to distraction. Um, this is a child who perhaps is talking constantly, interrupting. Um, maybe a student who's getting in trouble for talking during class. This is a child who may be daydreaming quite a bit, who may be disorganized and struggling um, to, to organize with lists and manage time. And then a child who has a hard time delaying gratification, controlling um, or filtering their verbal, physical, or emotional impulses. A few more signs um, of ADHD, and this is in the preschool to second grade range. Um, so for instance, the directions, put away your toys or you know, bring me your art supplies um, are not followed. That's supposed to say not, I'll adjust that. Um, not being able to, rem a child who's not able to remember a lesson um, that perhaps was taught right before recess, right? So let's say there was a, a topic that was taught right before recess and um, you know, at the coming back in, the child doesn't seem to have a memory of it. It could be related to the fact that they were actually not paying great attention or they um, have a lot of other thoughts going on. A child who's easily upset, um, perhaps when they that student doesn't catch a ball at recess or drops a pencil box on the floor and um, the pencils spill everywhere. A child who's going uh, too fast um, in general, so that could be with writing letters um, on a page or you know pouring a bowl of cereal. This could be a child who's getting up and fidgeting, um, you know, throughout the school day or even at home, um, maybe at the dinner table, a child who's talking during story time or during movie night at home. Um, and also that child who does grab things, um, that's not uncommon. So um, maybe grabbing peers things without permission um, and that kind of stuff. There's a lot, I'm sure you guys have other ideas for this. Um, I'm sure some of you know other potential signs. Um, any questions on that, on ADHD? I have some questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, uh, can you speak about social impact signs of ADHD? Speak about the what, the social, social signs of ADHD? Yeah, social impact signs. Social impact signs. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. So the social impact for ADHD. Um, well, one thing to consider with the social, with just sort of social function in general is that there is a lot that goes into that. So it's possible that a student with ADHD has some social struggles related to other issues, um, perhaps with like a delay in social skills or other issues that might influence um, social interaction. But ADHD itself um, can be hard socially for some students, especially students who are ch children who are um, hyperactive and impulsive. And I say that because impulsivity can um, be tough, right? So it can be tough, for instance, for peers who maybe um, are being interrupted throughout the day, or maybe um, you know a student with ADHD has a hard time filtering their impulses to, um, to grab that student's backpack. Um, 
or um, perhaps an emotional impulse to push them when they're upset. Um, so it really just, I think it really describes a student who struggles to develop good relationships or perhaps that child who's sort of considered um, the troublemaker. And that can certainly have an impact on self-esteem. But I think the other part of the social idea is that ADHD can also be a challenge in the home, right? So often when a student um, is struggling in the classroom, there's some difficulty there, but it could be a student um, kind of manages okay socially in a classroom perhaps, but maybe at home things are really hard and there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of fights with like um, parents or siblings. Um, so when we're thinking of ADHD interfering with relationships and relationship development, we're thinking that it's having a, um, a social impact. I have a couple more. Uh, the next one is, um, if a child goes to a private school, if they can be evaluated by, by the school district as well. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Yes, absolutely. So it really depends um, on the location um, where the, like the student resides. So the family would need to um, identify their local school district and contact their local school district. And um, that is still an option. And, and I guess the idea is that just having that information um, could be helpful. And then whether or not, I mean, that family may want to consider a transfer to the public school and, and that could be an option. That's something that may be on the table. Um, that's not something that's required to have a public school assessment. Um, but yes, that's still, that is still an option for the private school system. And, and some private, um, for some of the private schools, um, there are, there are some private schools who are able to accommodate here and there, others aren't necessarily. Um, and there's also the private, the option of having a private assessment um, for any for any person, right? So whether, whether or not they've already had one through the public school um, district or they happen to be in a private uh, school setting. Okay, and the last one, I think you are going to address this one later, but I will ask you uh, what, IEP interventions can be done for ADHD? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it really does depend on the student. Um, there are sort of are the common, I have a common, um, I have a list of my most common suggestions for accommodation for different age ranges. And many of those, when a student is really struggling, um, I do, I'm thinking of some examples here. There are students who have IEPs for ADHD. There's, it's more common that those students have other things going on and it's not just the ADHD. Um, but I often include accommodations um, that I would, um, or, or you know, suggest accommodations that I would actually have included in the 504. Um, but when we're thinking of IEPs, we're thinking about interventions. So that's something that would actually be really helpful to discuss with the school because the idea, and I guess the question is, what do we need to do at this point, given that the ADHD is not, the accommodations for the ADHD are not enough, right? Assuming that there has been like a 504 in place, what do we need to do to intervene? Because there are some times when, when ADHD has such an impact on learning that interventions are needed. So that's the question. Um, I guess the IEP team can help with that also, um, but there's, it really depends on the child. Thank you, I have no more questions. I have, okay. now I have a couple. Sure. Um, since we're on ADHD here, what about bullying and ADHD? Do they understand when they are being bullied? And are there any resources to help kids who are bullied? So bullying is something that is more, is, um, I would say more commonly occurring, there's, there's a lot of overlap between developmental difficulties um, and bullying, and, and that can go either way. It can be that students who have developmental difficulties or behavioral difficulties are more readily bullied. And there can also be, you know, certainly with behavioral disorders or even ADHD, there can also be students who have those challenges that are more likely to bully. Um, so we see both. And I would say that when it comes to, I guess we'll, we'll consider both scenarios. When it comes to a child who's maybe getting bullied and a child who has ADHD who's getting bullied, um, it could be, this just comes to mind for me, this is, my, this is my thought process, but it could be that that student is not perhaps um, 
paying attention to what's going on in their social environment. They may not recognize that they're being bullied. They may not recognize that um, some of their behaviors may influence that. And, and I say that delicately, meaning, you know, if you have a student who's perhaps um, been impulsive or had some more conflict with their peers, um, those peers may um, be acting on some annoyance. And I also think that there's a lot of sensitivity that goes along with ADHD. Um, there's something called rejection sensitivity that has been found to be a common pattern with ADHD. And so when it, come, when it comes to bullying in general, but, but certainly bullying, um, the bullying of children who do have ADHD, there's quite a bit, I mean, it, bullying doesn't have a, a positive impact on, on any child, but there's certainly something to be said about this idea of rejection sensitivity in ADHD. Um, and then when you have a student with ADHD who's bullying, I, I of course think about impulsivity and perhaps there's this idea of internalizing and externalizing behavior Right, and that 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 can describe any child, whether or not they have ADHD. So, internalizing behavior is perhaps that child who may have some struggles and may internalize that stress and that negativity, um, and maybe think negatively about themselves, or maybe say negative, engage in some sort of negative self-talk, but but treat others, um, you know, very kindly or appropriately, and not act out. And then you have other kiddos, and there's actually often a combination. But you have other kiddos who may feel um, stress or pain or upset. And rather than, um, well, they could, they could direct that in, inwards, but they often act out in response to that. So I, I, I sort of think about ADHD um, in that context where you may have students who are feeling um, badly about some of their struggles with ADHD and um, acting out as a result. And, and impulsivity is huge with bullying, um, ADHD and bullying. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and uh, go on to the next slide then. Thank you, Mackenzie. Great. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm thinking um, what we can do here is we can actually um, watch the videos at the very end, if you don't mind. So I can go back to the couple of videos just to make sure that we have, um, we get through the content and we can go into question and answer and perhaps an exercise. So we can certainly come back to these. Um, I have two videos here. One um, is an interview with a young student with attentional issues, another with organization, uh, orga, organizational challenges. Um, here's some resources on ADHD. Um, you guys will of course have access to these. Here's another coexisting condition that I wanted to review. So communication disorders certainly vary. There's, there's a number of different disorders to consider here. You'll notice the language disorders that's listed um, um, on top, and that can include either receptive or expressive. Sometimes it's a combination of both. So when we have students who are struggling um, with language and they're struggling to understand what's being told to them and also to express themselves, this is so huge when it comes to learning, right? It's a huge, um, you know, it's, it's very, um, co it's common for children with language disorders to feel anxious, um, but having a combination of a language disorder and a learning disability, you can imagine that that would be incredibly difficult for a child. Um, because when we think about all of the things that we use language for, we really use language for every aspect of learning, right? We shouldn't because there should be other forms of instruction, but language is incredibly important um, for school. So when we have a kiddo with a language disorder, we wanna make sure that they're getting the help that they need. Um, there can be like different kinds of language disorders such as a speech or sound disorder, um, stuttering is another, another thing that can be um, stressful and, and co-occur with learning disorder. There's also this idea, and this is related to communication, but it's also related to social skill, um, a, a child's social skill set and, and thinking. So social pragmatic communication disorder is a disorder that includes um, difficulties with understanding nonverbal behavior. So reading between the lines, um, social cues and the sort of unspoken social rules as well as relationships. So this is a child who may have a hard time um, not, you know, naturally understanding that when they go from the playground to the library, their voice volume needs to change or the student who may speak the same way to a baby um, that they would to an adult and maybe that maybe they use um, very formal language and descriptions. Um, so there's a lot of perspective taking with that. 
And then also with that, when we're thinking about social pragmatic communication disorder, and I didn't include much information on this topic in this presentation, but we also wanna consider whether or not a student may be on the autism spectrum, whether or not there's maybe a nonverbal learning um, disorder. So thinking about nonverbal learning skills overall, visual processing and that kind of stuff. Motor disorders are important to consider. So developmental coordination disorder, has to do with the um, understanding and execution of coordinated motor skill. Um, so this is something I, I say learning or understanding as if you know there's a lot of thought that goes into that. Um, when it comes to, to coordination, um, we don't always explicitly teach that, right? It's sort of this natural process when it comes to movement. Um, you know, athletics do does teach this, PE does teach this, but when we're thinking about developmental coordination disorder, we're thinking about children who are delayed for their age with different movements and coordination. So children who are perhaps struggling to do what's expected of them in PE or catch a ball, um, ride a bike, given the opportunity to learn those skills. Um, this can interfere with some sort of basic self-care and activities of daily living, um, can also impact school function. We're thinking about like the coordination that's involved in doing different um, classroom like movement activities, even writing. Um, the onset is early in the developmental period. So this isn't something that we're identifying in like middle schoolers. This is something that we're identifying in younger children. Um, and it's, it's related to, I mean, we have to pinpoint the motor deficit itself. It, it would be important to consider whether or not there's an intellectual delay um, or disorder, um, visual impairment or other neurological conditions that, that might go along with that. There's also something called stereotypic, uh, or stereotypic movement disorder that involves repetitive, um, rather purposeless movements. I'll, I would argue though that that movements um, happen for a reason, there's a stimulus involved, so they may seem purposeless. It may be a child's way to regulate. Um, so hand waving is one um, example, body rocking, head banging. Um, so sometimes those things can be distracting um, and cause some sort of social difficulty. And they can also create safety concerns. So it is important to address this, but there are other times when a student, for instance, if a student is doing something that we sometimes refer to as stimming or moving their body in a way that's rather rhythmic, um, that may be something that they need to regulate. Um, all of these things may be, but we wanna make sure that students have opportunities to learn how to um, get the movements they need um, at different times throughout the day so that they can learn as best as they can. Um, and we wanna make sure that we have a good understanding of what's going on with that also, as, as much as we can. There's only so much we can understand about, about movement, but it would be good to have an assessment if there's concern there. So mental health disorders and anxiety um, are really important to consider, both anxiety and depression, but anxiety certainly interferes with the, the brain brain's functioning, right? So the frontal lobe is responsible for those, execu those executive functions that I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation. And anxiety can really interfere with um, learning and certainly when anxiety is moderate to severe. So we wanna make sure that we're thinking of anxiety as something that can have an impact um, on learning. Generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder is, is more specific. Um, and that can also have a really big impact on learning when we have children who are not comfortable in the school environment, they're not comfortable being around others. This is an interesting topic in relation to the um, distance learning that's been the case for so many um, lately. So for some students with social anxiety disorder, social phobia, the distance learning um, was a better fit in some ways. Um, perhaps less stimulating, um, but also, you know, not ideal in other ways. So it's something that um, we want to make sure we're considering now that students are going back to school. Um, and anxiety, I will get into this right here. So anxiety or learning disorders can be very anxiety provoking. Um, so children with learning disorders are often very anxious and anxious related to their learning struggles because it can be very stressful being in a school environment. Um, and having a learning disorder, certainly when it's not being appropriately um, accommodated and perhaps, you know, unidentified. 
that can be very stressful. So students generally want to do what's expected of them at school um, and the learning process becomes stressful when a child with an unidentified um, and or unaccommodated learning disorder is expected to meet standards that they cannot um, meet. So making sure that educators have a, have a sort of unique to that child approach, a gentle approach, um, an encouraging and patient approach is going to be key, but there can be quite a bit of complexity with children, um, whether or not they have learning disorders, and there can be many other aspects to consider as well. So this can take a lot of work, figuring out what, what approach is going to make the most sense for different behaviors. So depression is another thing to consider. Um, many students who do have significant depression struggle to learn, right? Because it, that depression um, can create decreased mental, en mental energy and clarity. Um, so it can certainly interfere with learning. And then on the same, you know, on the other side, many students with learning disorders, as with anxiety experience, um, coexisting depression related to their learning challenges. So it can be um, depressing, it can impact student self-esteem. So it's important to consider that when it comes to um, learning and school function. Memory and processing challenges or disorders are important to note just because um, they really have a significant influence on learning. I sort of consider them in the learning disorder category, meaning when we're doing an evaluation, we wanna make sure that we're understanding the memory functions and the processing and all different kinds of processing. There's like auditory processing, for instance, visual processing. Um, so it's important to consider that those things can have a really significant influence on learning and they can even impact testing, like even IQ testing. Um, so it's important to consider that kind of stuff. Um, these students may appear to have a learning disorder and they may, um, but we wanna make sure that the memory and processing disorders are considered also to make sure that we identify them in case they, um, they are having an, a pretty significant impact. So we'll have the best understanding, I think, um, the best scenario for having a really clear understanding of a student's learning profile would include having those different functions assessed, right? So when I'm reviewing assessments that have been done, I'm looking for certain things, wanting to make sure, certainly if there are questions, um, sometimes there's an assessment and there's a straightforward concern and it's accommodated and things are going much better. But you know, in the case where there's continuing struggles and questions about what's going on and how to help, we wanna make sure that the, the evaluations include um, a thorough review of like these functions and perhaps others. There are certainly tests that can help identify um, memory and processing challenges. And there are also supports uh, that can make it easier for these students to remember and to process things process information. So this is all very connected. Um, this is an important idea because I think what we often do and what can be, from my perspective, very helpful as a clinician is to identify, sort of split up um, the mix of challenge to really understand what's going on. But all of these challenges, when it comes to learning, attention, um, motor skills, social thinking, mental health, like all of these things are very connected. So we wanna make sure that we're thinking about learning disorders holistically and considering how certain things may influence others. Let's see here. Um, I was gonna have us do an exercise, but I'd also be open to answering any questions at this point if, um, if anyone does. We have about 10 minutes left here. So if anyone does have any question that they wanted to review, I think now would be a good time. I have a couple questions. Uh, one is, what's your um, uh, general consensus about the use of the ASQ, which I assume stands for Ages, Stages, Ages and Stages Questionnaire slash SE? Yeah, so I'm I'm get um, I'm thinking of that. I'm wondering if that may be coming from like a, a provider or a clinician, but that that is a good screener. It, it's a good screener for like social and emotional development specifically. Um, there are some good things about it. I think it, it's, I, I wanna say it's, um, there's some uh, thought about like different cultural um, considerations. I think there's some good thought about different behavioral um, patterns. When it comes to learning, I, I don't necessarily think it's, it's a great screener for that, not to say that it can't pick up on certain things. Um, and I think that there's a lot of things to consider with screeners. So for instance, um, cost and um, 
and you know the, the way that we're utilizing them too, if we're utilizing them, if they're being used routinely. Um, I typically, for the early childhood um, evaluations that I do, and of course I'm in a specialty practice, so I, I specialize in child development and behavior, but I often use the Mullen scales. Um, and those are rather thorough, but that's also, it's a different kind of assessment, right? There's a lot more that goes into it, um, or there's a lot more that goes into that sort of assessment. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I've got one last one here. Um, I, I think you briefly mentioned rejection theory, um, uh, I guess with ADHD and bullying. So a person would like to have a little bit more explanation about that. Yeah, that's, it's, um, it's definitely a, it's a concept that isn't really discussed very often. It's, it's not something that we routinely talk about. And it, it's something that um, has been discussed within the ADHD community, probably more so than in, in um, even in clinical practice, but it's something that I personally have observed um, in individuals with ADHD that it's not always it's something that's, it can be rather subtle. It's not always apparent, right? So it's not always something that, that, um, children like demonstrate, they don't always show signs of this, right? It's not always clear that there's this internal rejection sensitivity, but it's a pattern that's been witnessed with ADHD. And I think that it's important to discuss because when we have a student who's struggling to pay attention um, they can struggle in multiple ways, right? They can have a hard time with impulse control that can influence their self-esteem, um, their social life, their learning. Um, and it's important to consider too that children with ADHD, they don't want to have struggles with attention, right? They, they're not acting out because um, they're wanting to act out or they're wanting to um, perhaps like hurt someone like that's, that's something that's really important to consider. And so I think rejection sensitivity is a little wrapped up in that and that, um, they, a lot of children with ADHD, they may already feel, um, sensitive about, about their, um, difficulties or their behavior. And when it comes to fitting in, um, I think that those difficulties that are there can sort of, um, make it all the more harder to, to feel um, included or to feel um, the sense of belonging. And so it's this pattern that's been identified and discussed before. Um, and this idea of rejection sensitivity speaks to the importance of um, making sure that individuals, individuals with ADHD feel um, accepted for who they are, whether or not their ADHD is well controlled, um, and that they know that um, they're struggling because of their ADHD often, right? That that's another thing too, is sort of differentiating, um, you know, a child's intention and, and their functioning. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, if you can talk about the kinds of support for memory and processing disorder. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I can certainly do that. I, I, um, Let's see here. I have actually some documents for that that I might need to pull up to review that. So if we could maybe save that until the very end, or I can even share my contact info with you and I could I could send you that information if you don't mind. Cause there's there's so much that goes into it. There are a couple of things um, that when it comes to processing too, like a, a couple of accommodations that can be implemented in the classroom pretty easily. Um, like giving students some check-ins after instructions have been delivered, giving them a little extra time for things like if there's a slow processing speed. Um, and with memory, there are some exercises that can be also rather easily implemented. So I'll, we'll make note of that and make sure to, to get that to you. Does that sound okay? Sure, thank you. And the last one is, uh, is brain imaging uh, really, really available to any patient with ADHD? Good question. That's, that's a really good question. It's, um, I want to say yes. I mean, it's available if, if you, um, are, you know, if someone's really motivated to, to look into that and to learn about it, it's not something that's very commonly, um, sought. Right. And I think the reason is that brain imaging isn't really going to alter treatment much at this point. Um, my personal, and I think when we're thinking of like clinical care and ADHD, I would say that it's probably the consensus among um, ADHD providers that it's it's not important and doesn't change treatment and it's you know it's can be costly and 
things like that. But from my perspective, I'm, I'm a big proponent for research, um, like ethical research. And I think research is a really important, um, thing. And I personally, um, care about research. And so it's something that I think if, if that's something that you also value, if you're curious and wanting to contribute to research, um, there are op opportunities for brain scans. That it just might take a little bit of digging and sort of, um, finding a good fit. And I could help if you do have interest in that, I can help you um, kind of look into that, but it's not something that is like a routine thing. So we don't typically, um, rec you know, we don't re typically recommend that when we do an ADHD assessment, we don't have pediatricians who are like talking about it with, with patients. Um, but it's something that we've learned. I think what we've learned is when we, we, the more we've done this, we've identified like, oh, wow, there are some um, differences here when we're looking at these minds and it can be very helpful. And the same goes for sensory processing, uh, processing disorder. Although that's somewhat new, it, it's like a novel thing. It's emerging. We have emerging evidence, um, but it's really fascinating to look at um, with sensory processing disorder. It's um, some differences with white matter. And I think it's really interesting. So if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to share more info with you. And another question came up. Um, it's a question about the use of supplements with 5-HT or L-tryptophan. Hmm, let's see here. And in, in the context of like ADHD? Yeah, in the context of ADHD, because she said that um, she has been reading about the lack of dopamine and or serotonin. Mm, okay. Yeah, so I would say that um, there's, there's still a lot um, going on in terms of research. Um, when it comes to understanding ADHD and what goes into it, but we do know quite a bit, like we know about the dopamine. I heard you mention that. Um, and we have, there's emerging evidence that shows some supplement supplements could be helpful, um, or at least a little bit helpful. And, and, you know, they're not risky, typically the ones that we recommend. I don't, I don't routinely recommend what you listed. Um, like omega-3 fish oil has been shown um, to have some subtle benefit um, and it's, you know, it's okay for young children to take that. Um, what I will say though, is that when it comes to the idea of personalized healthcare, personalized medicine, we're at a point in, um, when it comes to science and research where we're able to look at people's, um, genes and their genetic information and sort of use that info to understand, um, what sort of neurotransmitters or chemicals, um, may be processed by one person, um, like how they may be processed in one person versus another. And that could be important in considering supplementation. And it's something um, that um, is becoming more accessible and affordable as well. So that's something that um, if you'd like information on that, I could share it, but I don't really have any recommendations about those specific supplements. Um, but you may, you may be able to find some more info on those. Thank you. I have no more questions. Okay, you're okay, I think it's time to wrap up. Mackenzie, any last words? And then I'll kind of wrap things up. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess um, we'll end with this idea of um, just con continuing to consider um, what it is that with your child, what it is that challenges your child and perhaps makes their learning harder. If you can sort of be um, a detective and, and think about that um, as best as you can. And then also consider things that have been supportive of your child's learning. So a few things that have made it easier um, for your child to learn. And then I would encourage you to continue to consider these thoughts um, over time. Um, and that can be helpful too. I think parents and um, of course, healthcare providers and helpers, um, teachers, professionals in the community, there's a lot that we can do to help children um, learn and have the most, um, I guess the best education possible. There's a lot we can do there to give them good learning and educational experiences. So thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks. Um... Uh, Mackenzie, um, in terms of, I just want to make clear with, with supplementation, I really do want people to uh, check with their pediatrician and not just say, um, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and try this. They, they really need to make sure with their pediatrician about any future supplementation beyond um, a child's vitamins. So um, let's make that clear. Absolutely. And um, I just want to thank everyone for spending time today. Um, I'm posting a poll with just one question that the professionals could answer it. Hold on, I gotta find it here. Oh, here we go. Um,
and 